richest set of features of any modern production RGBMS, and I am including commercial DPS I, I would defend that position. As a project, it has a relentless focus on quality security and compliance with specifications compared to certain other open source databases that tend to have more of a feature first related to different products as opposed to quality. And it's capable of very high performance. Um, one of our clients is Instagram, which runs on Postgres on Amazon, in fact. And if it can handle their scale, it can handle your scale. <laughs> Anyone who says Postgres is not scale, I just pull out you know, a, a picture from Instagram and say. But then you hear this, it's hard to administer. Um, this frustrates me greatly because it's not. Um, here's a machine that was is sitting in my office. I bought it in 1997. Um, so Dell has a couple of SCSI drives, and I think one of the SCSI drives is dead now. Um, it's running Postgres 9.2, and I spend about 10 minutes a year administering the system. It, Postgres is not hard to administer. And it'll run on almost anything for a little time. So, so far, so good. So, a little bit of background about. Where Postgres came from. This is mostly for educational value, entertainment value. The reason it's called Postgres is it derives from the project of Postgres. It's called Postgres. Um, originally, Postgres did not use SQL, SQL is a query language. It used its own uh, language called Quell. Um, the reason Postgres is called Postgres QL is they added SQL to it. It originally was derived from a project called Ingress, and Postgres was the one after Ingress. Postgres. Um, Michael Stonebreaker was at that time a professor at the University of California in Berkeley, and um, he did not invent multi-version concurrency control, but he largely popularized it as a, as a real production technique. We'll talk about multi-version concurrency control. Um, it's interesting because th this code base also went on to become the Illustra for, um, commercial database product, and then which then became Informix. Um, it also became Sybase, and from there, the older versions, they've since replaced most of this code. The new versions of Microsoft SQL, so this code is all over the place. Um, you can't get away from this From this project. This project was hugely influential in the development of databases. Um, and since 1995, it's been an open source project. Um, it uses its own license, um, which is the Postgres license, when, unsurprisingly which is derived from the MIT ESD license. One of the things that is good about that license, in my opinion, is that you can create commercial variants, closed source variants of Postgres, and there are a lot of them out there. There's Vertica and Greenplum and all of that, uh, Trevisium, and all these um, big data um, database products that are built from the Postgres source. So there's a very fertile ecosystem around Postgres. And of course, I can't. Enterprise DB, which is a commercial version specifically intended for Oracle ports from, from Oracle to Postgres. Oh, I did slides about this. I forgot. Um, so, one of the things that's important is, unlike, say, MySQL, it is, it is, the code is not owned by a commercial organization. So, you, there will never, no one can change the terms of the license or take this away from you. So, in, in that way, from a management point of view, it's very safe. It's a, it's a safe investment. You don't have to worry about your licensing issues. The, the, the Postgres SQL license is very straightforward. Um, it operates natively on pretty much any modern operating system and Windows. Um, <laughs> Bye. 
postgres terms with the, the number after the, the decimal point increments, that's a major release. So 9.1 to 9.2 is a major release. Those happen about every 9 to 12 months. They're not, it's not on a fixed time schedule. It's on a when it's ready schedule, but that usually is about when it's ready. Uh, there are constant minor releases for bug fixes and security updates. Um, there are very, very few uh, uh, security or data corruption bugs. It used, um, we did have one recently that was the responsible for the 912 fix. It was an index-related problem, so the core data did not get corrupted. But if you're running on a version of 9.1 or 9.2 that is not the most recent, um, when you go home, we'll log in remotely and upgrade your database to the latest version. Um, the community as a whole, the development community for Postgres, has a very strong focus on data correctness. It's really the most important job of any database is what you put in comes back out correctly. If it doesn't do that, you kind of don't, you really shouldn't be spending time on any other feature. Uh, Postgres does do that. So, um, as I said before, it is certainly the most feature rich open source database, without any question. And then I'll do this about three or four times in the presentation because I'm going to talk about it. So. It has a focus on what I would call big database features. Features are handling large quantities of data, large quantities of structured data. High rate online transaction processing, data warehousing, things like that. Its feature set equals or exceeds those of commercial databases. There are features in Postgres that you know, extremely useful features that no commercial database uh, has right now. And it has a lot more features than we can discuss here, but we'll try. Um, one thing is that first attracted me to Postgres, um, people with Oracle background. <clears throat> Isn't Oracle's date and time handling great? No, no it's not. It's actually horrible. Um, and it's you know, unimproved since we're basically Oracle 1. And, um, um, one of the things that attracted me to Postgres is it has an extremely powerful range of date and time times. For temporal data, it's almost unmatched. But if you don't like those, you can create user defined types. Who here is using Postgres? the geographic information system layered on top of Postgres. That's really something only Postgres could do. Because of the because what Postgres is is a whole geographical information system that is essentially a set of custom types and functions layered on top of the core Postgres project. It's not magic. It's not like they had to go and hack the source up to make it work. Um, it has built-in fast multi-language full text search, something that un underused feature of Postgres in my opinion. Um, uh, you can talk more about that if you like. It's extremely sensible. You can add like you can add functions in a wide variety of languages or write your own language for it. Um, it has all of these data types. And let's just keep going. It has built it has some geometric types built in, which are good for basic stuff. It's not a full GIS, but for just you know for just <coughs> Starbucks, it's probably Has built in XML. One thing I did not add is now it has built in JSON as a type. Um, and, and one of the programming languages you can add to it is, v, is the V8 uh, JavaScript engine from Google. So you can build, grab, uh, do a lot of JavaScript natively in the system. Postgres, uh, we'll talk about that. In the integrated programming languages, Python, Perl, Ruby, Java, R. R is really useful actually. It's a statistics language. It's quite useful. So, um, I said that. Uh, haven't updated the slide. Coming soon is coming now. I put you. So it's now web scale because apparently what web scale means is you can do JSON data. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Things that you would like to be covered? Yeah. Okay. First thing you need to do is install. source, like our crowd ancestors, um, you generally don't want to do that unless there's a reason you absolutely must, like you're customizing something that can only be customized in recompilation. Truth be told, I've never seen a really practical reason to do this. Sometimes there are some platforms that are somewhat under-supported, that don't have their own packages, <laughs> and then building from source makes sense. Uh, this works on any 
platform that Blizzard runs on. That's the good news. Um, you get the maximum control. You can build things in or out. Um, you have to have the development tools, of course. And if you do this, there one of the nice things about the packages is they tend to ship with um, platform-specific utility scripts, like NIT.D scripts and all sorts of good stuff like that. When you build open source, you don't get any of that. That's all on you, which may be a feature, not a bug. Um, packages are available for all major Linux distros. Um, you may need to use custom repositories. One, one, this is especially true of Red Hat derived things like uh, Fedora and CentOS as well, or Scientific Linux, because they tend to lag really far behind on development. Uh, a gentleman uh, named Dimri Gündüz, whose name I just terribly mispronounced, um, is a Turkish uh, Postgres developer. He packages Postgres for the Red Hat families and stays very close up to date, so a couple days after a new version ships, their, their package is in his repo for it. Uh, Martin Pitt packages it for the Ubuntu family, and there's really no reason not to use their packages. They're very high quality. Um, you go there, you get the links to everything. Um, one thing that can be confusing, especially if you're a consultant like me, and you keep bouncing back and forth between different, different systems, is the Debian derived and Red Hat derived um, packaging have different directory structures on how they lay out things in Postgres because of the idioms between Debian, um, specifically Ubuntu, and uh, Red Hat. So we'll talk a little bit about that. You just have to remember that, for example, Red Hat puts all of the configuration files in the native directory. Um, Ubuntu puts them over in etc. Postgres, major version, main directory. And there are good arguments either way. Every time I'm on one, I'm frustrated that it's not like the other. <laughs> so, hey, we'll discuss those. Um, there's one click installer available for Windows from Enterprise DB. No, no, no reason to use anything else for it. Um, OS 10, um, you can do a one click installer from, there's one click installer from the project. Macports supports it, uh, Fink supports it, and there's also a very neat for development, this is very neat. Uh, Heroku, which is a company that specializes in running development uh, uh, deployment stacks on top of AWS, Amazon's product, um, has a thing called Postgres.app, which is just like it sounds, is a desktop application for OS X. You start up the application and Postgres runs, you quit the application, Postgres stops. It's very nice for development purposes. And for everything else like Solaris and other exciting things, look at Postgres. So far, so good. Yes. Um, creating a database cluster. Um, so, a single PostgreSQL server, that is to say, a single root program with its child processes, can manage any number of databases in Postgres terminology. This is one extremely unfortunate bit of Postgres terminology. The whole group in Postgres, the whole set of clusters on a single server of databases, on a single server is called a cluster. This is a terrible name now, because of course cluster now means a bunch of different servers. However, this term is baked into Postgres <laughs> and um, is, is used very widely, so we'll just have to deal with that. Um, so yes, it's very confusing and I'm fully acknowledged. Um, so let's take a database. So this, a database is an autonomous collection of objects. You have tables, the schemas, all the stuff. Um, cannot directly join between two databases. So that's that. Databases are, wall, are completely walled silos in Postgres. Um, you can use foreign data wrappers, to, um, which is a relatively new feature in Postgres, to open one database inside of another and present it as if it was a table. But it's really not the same thing as doing a full-on join between them. Um, if you're familiar with MySQL, what MySQL calls a database is much more similar to what Postgres calls a schema. That is to say, it's a namespace inside of a database. So, remember how I said the whole cluster was called, the whole, the whole set of databases was called a cluster, and each thing inside of it was called a database. Postgres then violates that nomenclature immediately in all its commands, uh, in all its uh, shell commands, which is again really unfortunate. It's historic. Because we have this thing called an NDB, which creates a cluster. Not a single database, as opposed to create DB, which creates a single database. 
I, I have no explanation. We just look like um, but it. But an NTB does secrete the files that will hold the cluster. It lays out the file system for you. It doesn't automatically start the server. And many packaging systems, by the time you're done, this is all done for you. But Ubuntu fires up and actually starts the server in the morning, which can be a little surprising if that's not what you meant. Um, the Red Hat packages do all the creation, but they don't start the server for you. They just leave it there ready to go. Postgres ships with a, product, a little command, a command tool called PGCTI. Um, it's a built-in command to start and stop the server. Um, it's, this is usually what the, uh, the upstart or whatever your favorite thing to manage services are calls. It's a um, nice little wrapper to start the server, stop the server, or manage the, the actual program. Um, most package pro script, uh, packages provide their own scripts. To do this, use those rather than raw PGCTL, unless you have a particularly good reason to, like we suspect the package description is behaving. So, Postgres go directories. All the data lives on the file system. Postgres does not have any special root to the files. It uses the files, it uses the real, normal file system files, which it opens and closes <coughs> using normal file system calls. So, it doesn't use a raw block device or have its own special file system or any of that. So, let's call that PG data. So one thing, you, one thing I would suggest that you do is if you happen to your laptop happens to have a Postgres on it, is find that and do an LS. This would be interesting to see. Don't worry, you can't hurt anything. Don't type RM. But the, 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 you'll see a directory there called base. That's where the actual data lives. It's inside that directory. Um, and the transaction logs live in PGX. This might, in some installations, this is like elsewhere, but they look at the So one of the things you, you may see in here, or in the case of Debian like Ubuntu, they'll be elsewhere, they'll be in etc. Those first go nine, one, nine, two, whatever, main thing, are the configuration files. On most installs they live in base, on Debian, they live there, so it's separate from base. Find them, you should see these two. You'll see these two. These are the big ones, and these are the ones we'll talk about. There are there are some others, but really this is what it's all about. Okay, so configuring Postgres. There are really only two that matter. Uh, PostgresGuild.com, which has all of the server set, major server settings in it. And PGHBA.com, which is who gets to log into the database. A little bit about um, log about permissions. Um, all of Postgres's access controls are based around roles. A role is a database object, it's a thing that lives inside the database. It's cluster wide. So if you create it for one database, you've created it for all databases. And it can own other objects, and it has privileges, like you can write to a table. A user is just a role that gets that has the login privilege. So the term users and roles tends to be used uh, kind of interchangeably in an informal way. Really, a user is just a role that has the lock. And it's based around it. And the security system is based around 
a route bus user just gets to log in. So, let me this moment. So let's just take a look at it. Everyone get that password? Um, let's see. So, um, this is my, my convention router, obviously. It's an OS 10 machine. Here's what base look on um, the, the top level directory looks like. Um, in OS 10, the, um, the, everything's at the, um, at the everything's at the top level, so the big files are here. If we just take, take a quick look inside the base, you never really need to poke around inside of it. Um, but that's where all the actual data lives. And if you look at the, at the GX log, look at all those. Um, there are the transaction logs set. Okay. Fortunately, pghpa.com has a lot of is, is pretty accurately commented. But let's um I've edited mine slightly. The, the, the basic structure of it is the type of connection, the uh, the type of authorization line. This is really illegible, so trust me on this one. Um which database? So local in this case means local um, means local <coughs> sockets. So if you're not using uh, the TCP IP stack, those are sockets. Which database? All is a special one that means all <coughs> user. Which users? The address, which is blank in the case of this, and the method. Trust means just take my word for it, and I'm allowed to connect to this database. <coughs> what very frequently happens is you'll install Postgres. It'll be up and running, and the very first thing you do is, is from some random user, you'll try and log in as the Postgres super user. And it will give you this message about pure authentication. Pure authentication means essentially, uh, essentially it, it's using the, um, the Postgres, it's using the Unix user to authenticate. So what that usually means is you have to either switch to the Postgres user or set everything to trust, which is probably a terrible idea for a production server. Obviously, this is a development machine, so I'm, you know, I assume that if my laptop is stolen, I have other things to worry about. Um, in the case of host-based authentication, it's host, the database, user, um, a net mask. So in this case, specifically the, the local host. And again, this one says trust. Um, the comments are pretty good about this, so I won't go into a huge amount of detail. But that's the... So that's what's going on there. So, um, PostgreSQL.com holds pretty much all the configuration parameters, um, all those that are compiled in, for some reason, on the server. You, if you have it, find it, open it up. I'll skip. We're gonna. I'll show you. So the problem is, when people open up PostgreSQL.com for the first time and they see, you know, all 300 bloody block configuration parameters, this is their reaction. It looks kind of like this, and the reaction is, we're all going to die, because there's like all these parameters, and they all like they sound like they do really important things, but you have no idea to change for the system. And the comments, while accurate, are not helpful in this regard. But it's really like that. You, know, you can change like 12 things, and you're up and running, even on a production system. So the important, uh, we'll talk about these important groups of parameters. Logging, memory, and checkpoints, a couple of planner settings, not much, but then you're done. So really, it's about 12, 15 parameters, you're all set. No, you're done. So we're going to start with logging, and the reason I like to start with the logging parameters is you can, a lot of the data that you get out of the logs informs the rest of your decisions. So on any but the most high logging system, it is possible to crush a system with logging. So don't, you know, 
if, if you have a system that's you know, doing 10,000 transactions a second, and you come back and complain to me that it's being killed by logging, yes, I did say it is possible. Most systems it is not. Logging is not your, your, your way to run out of horse power. And we're finding for performance problems that's your best source of information, right? So the first question is, what kind, where do you want Postgres to put its logs? Postgres generates a can generate a fairly voluminous set of output logs. Um, and they have to go somewhere. Do they go to files? Do they go to files? If you have a syslog infrastructure that you're using and that you like, um, then go ahead, then, then I suggest using syslog. Make sure you're using our syslog and over TCP, and, you know, things that, things where the, the um, where syslog is, where the, you're, you're reasonably confident that you'll get the data. Um, this will take care of log rotation and all this kind of stuff for you, and it's done. It's very handy. Um, in your rooting rules, make sure there's this little dash. You yeah, probably have to add this rule um, to make sure that what this does is prevents the syslog daemon from flushing on every single write, on every single new log entry, which in the case of Postgres logs, it would be a lot of disk activity. Um, thanks to Greg Smith of uh, uh, Second Project for cluing me in on this. If you otherwise use CSV format, um, CSV format is comma separated value format. Um, it is very it is machine, it's nicely machine parsable. Um, you can use built-in logging collectors to do rotation and things like that in Postgres. Don't use the old standard format. There's really no reason to do so anymore. Pick one of these two. If it's going to files, use CSV. Otherwise, it's just okay. So what do you want in this log? I'm um, assuming this is assuming CSV log, but just to say this is log. This is log. Here's my where I like to start. You can download the slides. You don't have to copy all this. But um, CSV log into the PG log directory. Turn on the logging collector. This is the pattern for the file name. Um, change rotate one day. As set up, you will have to do something to age out to the logs, and, um, like a cron job using find or something. You delete old logs otherwise. The, 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 this will not delete any old files. And you can set your own policy for how long you want to keep them around. Um, it'll automatically rotate if a log file hits a gigabyte, which it shouldn't under normal operations, but you never know. Um, this says any statement that takes more than 250 milliseconds, emit a log line that says it did it. Um, that's completely this is, that's an arbitrary number that's picked kind of like what most systems, I would say. Um, for a system that's doing, um, you might set that higher or lower, depending on your system. That's a good place to start if you don't have any clear idea where you want to go. Turn on checkpoint uh, logging. Um, turn on, on uh, connection logging and disconnection logging. And turn on lock with logging. And hit the wrong one. And this last one, if you set log count files to zero, you'll log any count file creation. And initially, that's what you want. If you have no idea what's going on here, just And then you're done. Okay, you can do your logging. Systems are running. Um, memory configuration. The primary memory configuration parameter in Postgres is this parameter shared uh, Postgres allocates a certain amount of system five shared memory when it starts up. Once and never <coughs> People agonize over this setting. It really is like what to name your child. People, people spend that much time on it. Um, I get emails from, people, from a customer saying, well, we've set shared buffers to 6 gigabytes. Should we set it to 6.5 gigabytes? I don't know. It will make no difference. <laughs> um, work them. Um, this can make a huge difference, however. Enormous difference. So this one is worth spending some time on. And then there's maintenance work, man. So let's share buffers. If you have below two gigabytes, shed it to about 20% of total system memory. This is assuming you are doing the correct intelligent thing and only running Postgres on your production machine. If you are running multiple <coughs> machines, especially things that use a Java virtual machine, you may have to reduce this to avoid memory starvation. But 
on your typical Unix-ish well, um, production server that's only Postgres, below 2 gigabytes, set it to about 20% of system memory. If you're below 32 gigabytes, set it to 25%. And if you're so fortunate that you have more than 32 gigabytes in your production server, it happens all the time these days. Set it to 8 gigabytes. And you're done. Forget, forget about this setting. Put a little loose site box around it.
is the amount of it. Sometimes Postgres needs to do the sortation or join type operations. It needs to sort a, ta sort a table or a result set. It needs to do a merge between two things. And it wants memory to do this. WorkMem is how much memory it will allow itself to do that operation. So if it's set to say 16 megabytes, if it thinks it can, it can fit this into 16 megabytes, it will allocate the memory to do this operation. Otherwise, if it exceeds that, the whole thing goes onto disk. So it's either or. It's not, it goes up to 16 and then that less little bit gets done on disk. Obviously, you can understand why this is a big <coughs> controller of performance. Because, above, because doing these operations on disk takes a long time to compare to them in memory. However, the thing to remember about this is it does this for every operation in the entire system at one time. It's not so if 23 things need to do sorts at the same time, it could allocate up to workmen times 23. So it's not global across the whole system. So just so just sending it to 8 gigabytes is probably an extremely unwise idea. So generally what you want to do is if you don't really have any idea about your system, and for a lot of these DevOps run systems, you don't. Yeah. Um, Start low, set to about 32 to 64 megabytes, and look in the logs for temporary files, because it'll log every time it needs to create one of these temporary files to do these operations. And set it to two to three times the largest template you see. And the question is, what, wait, two to three times? That makes no sense. The thing is, Postgres needs more memory in measuring bytes in memory than it does on disk, because it has pointers and all that kind of so to get those log files, those temp files to go away, but um, set it to about that. This can cause an enormous speed up. This in many ways is the Postgres consultant retirement plan. You come in and you say, and people are like, oh my god, the system's dying, you just go ahead and tweet. Work down a little bit higher, the system speeds up, it's like, I'm off to a beat, that's great. Um, but you do want to be careful depending on your workload. Generally, I, you know, on the one hand, I want to scare people say, you know, 5,000 things could need all this work at the same time. In real life, that's about a 20 sigma chance that the, they all will. But don't just crank it as high as possible. Also, if some of these 10 files are 8 gigabytes, you're probably, you're probably um, not going to be able to fit all that into memory, unless that's the only operation that's going on on the server. So, you want to bump it up, but you want to be judicious about that. Starting to push the multiple, the, the you're starting to push, you know, the 500 gigs of megabyte range. You may want to uh, back off and only include those temp files that are the 90 percent of the temp files are then spilled, uh, are then done in memory. Okay, did that make sense? Great. It's gonna be the first time I've ever did. Um, maintenance work now. Okay. Um,
save for memory settings. So that wasn't too bad. Um, let's take a five of uh, a ten minute break at this point, and then we'll get back and talk about checkpoints. You can sit here for fifty minutes. And questions so far? Yep. Yes, oh, of course. Uh, I assume the answer is no, but does it uh, accept multiple log types or do I have to choose one of the three? Since this is log or and the uh... other. <laughs> That's a superb question. I have never done that. The reason why I'm asking is that. Somebody smart with this? Actually, you, you, you enter, you know, do you put multiple log types? I think, uh, um, and then <coughs> does it actually emit the log to multiple destinations? So if you say CSV log, comma, syslog, will it? I don't think so, but you can have a little plug in, does it? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I, I'll try it. I'm, I'm actually quite curious, because I think I've seen it, but I don't know if it is, it takes the first one, or if it does it multiple routes. So, 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 you stumped two of us, so that's a great question. No, the reason I'm asking is because you discard the standard error as obsolete, where is the most human readable?
another show of hands, like, how many people think they understand what the writing that law is about? Not you, Christian. <laughs>
So the timeout is 10 to, um, in this case, I'm giving you a range. This is not syntactically correct. You have to pick one. <laughs> so, uh, 10 minutes to 30 minutes. So when that timeout expires, it'll do a checkpoint. The first one that happens will do the checkpoint. So if it hits, six, if it hits the checkpoint savings first, it'll do one, or if it hits the checkpoint timeout. Okay. So how do we set these? Well, the answer is it can be a little tricky to decide where to set these. Um, here's, where, here's where you like to start. First, wall buffers just set that to 16 megabytes. Don't worry about it, just do it. I'm not sure why that's not the default, but it should be. Um, set checkpoint completion target to 0 0.9. We'll talk a little bit about what that magic number means. It's kind of a weird number. Um, basically, the higher this number is, the longer Postgres can take to restart, but the less I.O. it will do when it's running. And by restart, that's restart in the case of a crash. If Postgres shuts down normally and comes back up normally, this doesn't apply, because it will have already done everything that it needs to do. But if Postgres crashes and has to re replay the log, um, then it depends on, then we, um, um, the higher this number is, generally it takes about 20% of that number that's very rough, but so if you set it to 10 minutes, in the case of a crash, it can take up to two minutes for it to replay that long. So set it to sort of where your threshold of pain is as to how long you want Postgres to restart. Higher though is better. So what I suggest you do is just set these things, just blindly implement these settings. And then what? You look for the, look, every time Postgres, if you have a checkpoint logging turned on, which I recommended that you do. Every time Postgres starts a checkpoint and finishes one, it'll write it in the log. It'll write a little note to say that it started it. And the question you look how how close those are together, um, how close each new checkpoint is. And they're happening more often with checkpoint timeout. So you set checkpoint timeout to 10 minutes, but every six minutes it's doing a timeout, a, a checkpoint. Bump up checkpoint segments until it's, they're farther apart than checkpoint timeout. Eventually, of course, you'll get checkpoint timeout, and then there'll be every checkpoint timeout exactly because that's what will be causing the checkpoint to happen. Generally, you can do it by a factor of two, so take 32, and then 64, and then 128. You don't have to bump it by one. <laughs> you spend a long time with that. Um, so the, uh, the goal is that it's the checkpoint timeout setting that's causing the checkpoint to happen rather than the checkpoint segments. So that's the goal you're in. Um, so this, this brings up the um, what that checkpoint completion target is. Normally I just sort of wave my hands and say it's a magic setting, but we have a little more time, so I'll be. When, when Postgres starts a checkpoint, it could just take all of the dirty buffers and cram them into the I.O. subsystem as a single block. But that would be very bad, because you would probably saturate the I.O. subsystem, and nothing else would happen. So Postgres tries to spread out the I.O. over a certain amount of time. <clears throat> that The time that it picks is checkpoint timeout times checkpoint completion target. So if checkpoint completion target is 0.9, the record, what I recommended, and checkpoint settings, or checkpoint, sorry, checkpoint timeout is uh, 10 minutes, then try to spread the I.O. over about over 9 minutes. Bumping up that number reduces the amount of I.O. Um, you generally don't want to set it to 1, because if Postgres guesses wrong about the amount of I.O., that can be kind of an issue. Um, but you generally want it to do the I.O. for the maximum amount of time possible, since, of course, all the other I.O. is going on at the same time. <coughs> but yeah, so this is something you have to do analytically, because it depends on your workflow. A, a database that doesn't get very many writes is going to not need to do checkpointing very often at all. But um, ones that do um, a lot of I.O., or a lot of updates, to updates and inserts, they're going to generate a lot of work, <coughs> and those, those settings will be different. Um, one thing to be aware of as you bump up, all can pick up to three times 16 megabytes times checkpoint samples on the disk. So, you know, setting it to a billion is probably not a great idea. Um, you know, we're not talking about very much actual disk space here, but you do have to be aware that this will not be consumed if you're tied on disk. It is possible 
then restart in closed chest. In the case of a crash, again, not a normal restart, can take up to checkpoint timeout. It can take as long to replay it as it did. That's an extremely, that's extremely unusual, but it can. So don't, again, setting that to a crazy high value. I think 60 minutes is the highest is the threshold of the highest you can go anyway. Okay, then you're done with checkpoints. So there are some planner settings. There are lots of planner settings in this course, most of which you should never ever ever touch. Um, one you can touch is effective I.O. concurrency, which you want to set to the number of I.O. channels. Now, what are the number of I.O. channels? Well, if you're running on a RAID disk subsystem, it's the number of physical disks, spinning disks. So if you have a RAID, uh, a RAID span with four disks, set it to four. If you're running on an SSD, set it to the number of I.O. channels to the SSD. That's usually a multiple of 16 on most modern systems. Um, if, you, if, you, um, if, you, if you have no idea what to set it to, just leave a comment down. <laughs> Nothing bad will happen. Um, it helps hash joints, um, specifically, because it, it knows it can do parallel reads. Random page costs. Everyone's favorite parameter to track. Um, a little bit about what random page cost means. Random, um, the planner sometimes has to make decisions about whether or not it makes sense to scan an index, for example, versus just scanning the whole table. A bunch of things go into this calculation, but one of them is, so how fast is random access on the disk relative to sequential access? This ratio is that number of how expensive it is to get a random page versus a sequential page. The default is 4.0. Generally, that's too high, although you could make, you know, you could hard. Um, so here's, here are good starting values. For a typical rate 10 array, set it to 3.0. If you're on a SAN, 2.0 tends to be pretty good. If you're running on Amazon, I'm kind of running something on AWS, just out of curiosity. <laughs> yeah, Heroku is one or two things on AWS. Um, I generally set it to 1.1. That seems to work. But do you, do you guys have a recommendation for that? Because um, I've got, you know, uh, this is purely experiential, you know, it's like 1.1 seems to work, which is kind of, you know, not the strongest argument in the entire world, but, you know, what do? Um, so, um, the, the, the argument in favor of setting this is the EDS, the whole storage system on, that you generally use on Amazon, is so heavily virtualized, you, and you're competing with a lot of other traffic, you know, you kind of don't get a lot of sequential <laughs> action off of the off of EDS. The heads are doing something else. It seems to work. Um, so those two, and then you're kind of done. Here are things not to touch. Do not turn off FC. Or never, ever, ever turn off FC. What the, uh, turning off FC does is it breaks the guarantee that all your stuff is stashed onto disk before the before the transaction comes back. Um, and, and specifically, it, um, it doesn't even try to maintain on, on disk integrity. It'll, you know, it'll, it'll flush the stuff out when it gets around to it. The problem is, when you crash, the disk could, you could very well have a corrupted database. You cannot guarantee, and there is no guaranteed way of checking to see if your database was corrupted. You have to assume it is. So, now, that being said, there are very specialized conditions under which you can weaken this. For example, if you're bulk loading a brand new database, and you really don't care if, if the, the system stopped to go, oh, well, that was bad, throw away the database and try again. Turning off FC can significantly speed things up. The problem is, I, whenever I do this, I tell people, never, ever, ever, ever forget to turn it off. 50% of the time, they forget to turn it off. And then I go in and the big file and say, you're not, this is, Dead. You know, have a moment of speechlessness and have to point out gently because, and then they'll say, okay, fine, we'll shut it down. And then what they do is they use PGCTL and they use dash M immediate because they don't want to wait. I mean, it's an emergency. The consultant just told them it was an emergency. The problem is, if you put dash M immediate onto PGCTL to stop Postgres, it crashes Postgres. That's how it works. So you just broke it. And we just 
just have to say, well, that's why you have backups, right? Yeah, so this is why we say you really need to be in a position that you can just throw away your database to turn this on. And, and you have to be, have an operate, you know, be, be operationally sophisticated enough to know to turn it back on when the whole flow is Synchronous commit, uh, now synchronous commit has a, is, is significantly less dangerous. Um, so what will happen, synchronous commit, normally in Postgres, when you issue a commit statement to the database, that commit does not come back, does not um, return to the control to the client until Postgres is satisfied the right ahead log has been written, is up to date for everything that was involved in that transaction. Turning off synchronous commit breaks that guarantee. Your database will not be corrupted by turning off, at least on, on the logical level at least, by turning off synchronous commit. But if, if you do run the risk that if the system restarts, you will find that transactions you thought were committed aren't there. So, you'll, you'll, so basically you may not be as current, but you may be back in time somewhat. That's acceptable in some cases. I mean, if you're running a bank, it's probably not acceptable. But if you're, but that is acceptable, and it does improve performance. You just have to be aware that this is what's going on. And you know, and, and for example, if, if an application um, is reading things from an external source and consuming them, you have to be prepared. The application has to be prepared that something it thought was there isn't there anymore, and regenerate it from the external source or whatever. Um, one example of this is we have a client which uh, gets sensor data from thermostats on walls in buildings. If um, they turn this off and um, and there was a crash and the data was lost, and we said, well, that's what it does. And the problem was every time the application issued a commit, it went back to the sensor and said, okay, I've got it. You can release this data. And so they lost data forever because of that. And they were not happy about this, but we did warn them. Email that I could pull up. So, but um, so you, you need to be aware of this from your application. So, everyone's sufficiently scared. Um, when you're changing these settings, the good news is most of them you can just reload the server. Um, you don't have to restart it and break client connections to the server. Some of them, such as shared buffers, you have to shut the server down and bring it back up again. Interestingly enough, turning on the logging collector is one of these. So if you're switching from traditional logging formats to CSV logs, you probably have to do a server restart. This is kind of annoying, but there is. One of the neat things about Postgres, this is way on you, that really needs to be used for, is many of these can be set per session. So for example, um, workbound, you can issue a set command at the command line and change it just for your session. So, for example, you have all these clients that are connecting, inserting stuff into the database, and then you have one big analytic query that comes in and needs lots of sorts and that kind of stuff. It can just um, change, change its local value of work now. That's really nice. You can also change it for particular database users. So, for example, that, that analytic user could log in as a specific user and have the work and have its own local workman setting. Most settings you can do this with. Basically, almost any that don't require a server restart. You can do the documentation. Um, documentation explains whether or not you can. But that's a very useful feature. Um, for workman, it's great because, for example, if you have just this one big analytic query, you can give it to Gigabyte's workman because you know that another 200 aren't going to exhaust it. Okay. Before we move on from settings, questions? Yes. Um, you said we should find the role of the right value for checkpoint segment mm -hmm. laying around with respect to checkpoint timeout. Mm -hmm. So you suggested that we should favor checkpoint timeout. Mm -hmm. Why is that? If we were just the traffic pattern, why the largest well, the um, it'll all, of course when it does the flush, it won't. Um, it will only do the flush if it needs to. So you know, there are no dirty buffers. The timeout expires. There, there, and there are no dirty buffers. So that too. Well, there are some, but not enough to justify a checkpoint. Well, so it's a little traffic during the day, during the night. Right. 
So why should I do the requirements anyway? Um, it depends. Um, I guess the question is why not? You know, it's um, because, because of flavor or with the check on time. Now. Right, right. Well, I mean, my question is what, what bad thing are we trying to avoid? Because if, if, if very little is happening, the checkpoint is going to like take micros milliseconds. Because, you know, if there are only five different buffers, it's only going to write, you know, it's going to take very little time to write them. So I don't think there's any harm. Should there be harm, then why is there a checkpoint segment harm? Because that controls how long Postgres, that also controls how long Postgres um, can take to uh, uh, could take to restart. The idea is, if in an extremely busy system, you will, um, if the, the, if this, the, the time is slot that the, the, there's the, wall clock time. There's also kind of a logical time, how much stuff has happened since then. You want you want to cap that even if it doesn't fit the checkpoint time. Um, so for example, if it's generating a huge amount of traffic and you know it's generating a thousand wall segments or something, you probably want to do a checkpoint so that restart time is under control. Um, the, um, for for when the system comes back up. And
conceptually, you can think of it as it starts with the very first time you create the database cluster and it goes forever. Into the future. Of course, in reality, that would be insane. So, it's used to store the database on a normal termination. Under normal operations, it's just a bunch of data that you never look at again. With the exception of, now once we talk about replication, it has a use there. But it's absolutely essential to avoid data corruption. You've got to have it. Um, um, in the case of a crash, and again, a lot of the time I will use the term restart, but you have to sort of change what I'm saying is a restart after a crash. Under normal restart, it doesn't have to replay the log. The last consistency is the last time I checked my pitch. One of the nice things about the wall is it's time ordered, so you can replay it to a particular point in time. And it's pinned only. So it often pays to put it on its own file system, um, specifically on its own set of spindles. You know, so because on a SAN, you know, you can create your own file system, but whatever, it's just part of you know, the general cluster of data disks. But it's on its own spindles because that way the heads aren't moving very much. Um, you can also put it on an SSD, of course. One thing to remember about it, um, putting it on an SSD is SSDs have bad erase characteristics. So eventually this will fill, will, will have, will not fill up because to everyone's mind that means this is full and it can't take any more data. That's not a problem. But every time, but if you have to go back and rewrite a portion, you know, spinning disks, if you delete a file and go back and write the same space on the disk, no problem. It just rewrites it. SSDs, it has to erase it first. Oh, bless you. Um, and that's slower. So frequently, once you use, once you slice spun through the SSD one more time, it's not actually any faster to put the right end log on an SSD. Somebody like cut screaming next bulging at me because I was saying bad things about SSDs. Like it was like, like you like it, SSDs were his children. It's very strange. Um, Warm standby and streaming replication, which we'll talk about later, are all based on the wall. Uh, the right event wall is the core technology that makes those work. Okay. Multi version concurrency control. Um, this is like really important to understand for more sophisticated understanding of Postgres because it's like core to the way to a lot of stuff in Postgres. Um, in case you'll ask questions on the Postgres list and the answer will come back, oh well. You know, that's a bad idea because of MVCC. And you go. And so, understanding why they're saying that. It stands for multi version concurrency control. Again, it was um, not exactly invented by Michael Stonebreaker, but he was the first one to like make it go in a real database. Um, Postgres QL, well, actually, um, Ingress was the first, uh, first database that ever really used it, but everybody uses it now. So it's not a, it's not a Postgres specific technology. In, in ODB on MySQL uses it. The alternative, it's, it's an alternative to pessimistic blocking strategies. Basically, the problem is um, it allows for much, much higher performance than traditional blocking. The basic problem is, um, so before we get to that, on any database, concurrent um, once, once you have one user, you think this is great. I'd like to have two users. You know, the problem is the the soon as you have two users, you have a problem, which is somebody opens a transaction, writes a record. Somebody else over here reads that, um, opens a transaction, writes the same record. What do you do? Or reads that record, and you can do the what older databases did was they said, fine, we'll just lock it, you know? And we'll, we'll put a we'll lock on it, but you try and read, the, read a, a, a tuple that's a, um, a record that's been updated. We'll just, we'll just block, and, we'll, and once, once it commits, you'll get one that you, know, that you like. Well, that actually really sucks for performance. That's really bad. MVCC allows you to get around that. So here are the rules on MVCC. Readers to the same row don't block other readers. This seems absolutely insane, and it was so insane that lots of databases used to actually work this way. Um, and people, people from the DBase era, original DBase didn't work this way. That was great. Loved it. Um, writers don't block readers. Readers get the old version. 
function of the same row. So once you once you do a write, over here you do a read. You see the tuple before it was updated. That's so so you can just read on through and keep going. Readers don't want writers. So if I've read a tuple, read 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 a particular row. By the way, sometimes I'll slip and say I'll say tuple versus row versus record. People will you know this is this is not very proper terminology, but they're all synonyms. That's um, so readers don't want writers. If I've read a row and somebody else writes it, that, that's fine. I don't care. Writers do block writers to the same row, not to different rows. But if the two writers try and get at the same row, the second one will, will block, waiting for the first one to commit. And what happens there depends on, on what's called the transaction isolation mode, and we'll talk about that. So, in essence, everyone at the start of the, of the way to think about it is when you issue a begin, you start a transaction, you get a version of the database that's all your own. And Postgres, to the extent possible, will try and maintain the illusion that no one else is changing the database out from under during that transaction. The, the way, the, the important phrase there, of course, is to the extent possible. Because one thing, one, one rule about Postgres, this isn't like written down anywhere, but it, it's the way to think about it, is time never forks in Postgres. There is one continuous truth on the database, and there are not two truths at the same time. So, some, so any place Postgres is forced into having to make a decision, which, which version of the database is the real one, it will make a decision. It won't let it fork. So a lot of the other stuff, and keep that in mind as we talk about the other stuff. So versioning. Multiple versions of the same row can exist at the same time. One of the consequences of this is when you delete or update a row, the old version of that does not immediately get removed from the database. So, if one transaction does begin and deletes a row, another transaction, another transaction could be reading that row, and it needs to keep it around. It can't immediately just punt it out of the database, even if that first transaction, the deleting transaction, commits because that reading transaction could still be open. Once the reading transaction commits, then it can throw it away. But the result is that we can get dead tuples in the database. Tuples that nobody can ever see again, but are versions that at one point someone could see. Because some of the transaction might still be um, able to do it, and for performance reasons, Postgres doesn't, at every command, go through the database and try and figure out what it now can because that would be, uh, from a performance perspective, that would be terrible. There, there's no way to make that work. So, the solution is everybody's favorite feature of Postgres. Vacuum. Vacuum. It does, well, vacuum does a bunch of stuff, but let's talk about it what it's being made for. It scans the tables and marks the dead versions as free. That's what vacuum does. Is, is vacuum is the bill that arrives at the end of the lavish MVCC banquet. Um, since version 8 of Postgres, there's been an auto vacuum daemon that largely takes care of this for you. 90% of databases never even have to worry about this. They just turn up, they just auto vacuum is on by default, it runs, everything's great. Sometimes if you do a major update or delete operation, it's good to run manual vacuum rather than just let auto vacuum take care of it. But generally, auto vacuum can be this problem for you. Related to vacuum, but not, not the same thing as a problem called analogs. Um, the planner at Postgres is very sophisticated. Sufficiently sophisticated, I'm not sure how many people really understand it, but it's, uh, it is very sophisticated. Analogs. Um, in order for the planner to make good decisions on how to execute a query, it needs good statistics. Analyze collects those statistics. That's what Analyze does. It's done as a part of backing. You can't do it separately. Um, basic, the main function of Analyze is it builds a histogram of the distribution of values in, in each column and each table. So it has an idea of how of, 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 how, of what kinds of joints will make sense with these. Always do this after a major database change. Like, especially if you just restored a database for backup, this is the statistic.
statistics do not come in the background. This is an extremely common problem, a real-life problem. Someone will restore a database from a dump using PG Restore. And all the plans are like completely crazy. And they all call me and say, ah, and I say, did you analyze? And they, there's this long silence. And they say, OK, everything's fine now. Because they just did reanalyze on the database. OK, so the other, the whole idea behind MVCC is to minimize the amount of blocking. But we can't get rid of it entirely. Because the option, the other thing you have to do for locking is split time. You have two real life versions of the tuple and merge them somehow. And that's, you know, not, that, that's a research project. It hasn't been fixed. In order to maintain this, there are a lot of implicit models that most of um, There's a tuple lock on the individual database, right? um, either shared or exclusive. And you can have lots on tables, schemas, and databases as well. Tuple locks. Um, prevents the rope being modified that it can be read, any number of sessions in the shell on the same problem. Prevents the rope from being modified by anyone else, only one session will be exclusive. One of the things about Postgres is that you can get surprising locks. Um, this is, there's work to fix this, but this is a very common um, situation, which is writing a dependent row. <coughs> so you, this is a, you have a foreign key relationship. You have a parent table and a child table. The child table has a foreign key into the parent table. You write to, you write the, the dependent row. And that can take a share lock on the parent. And this is very surprising. If something else comes along and tries to um, delete or modify that parent, and it blocks. It's doing this so that the referential integrity doesn't get violated by a different transaction. But you can get deadlocks this way, and it can be quite surprising. Um, the, one of the ways I suggest solving this in schema design is what I call the fast flow data rule, which we'll talk about later. Um, table level blocks. Um, one of the, the primary places you'll run into this is when you modify the schema on a table while that schema change is running, like you add a column or you delete a column, it will take an exclusive block on that table. Now, just adding or deleting a column is very, very fast. And, the, and, um, and as long as you commit the transaction quickly, you're fine. The problem is, this can be very long if you're adding a non-null column. And this is an extremely common problem because the first time it happens, people are surprised, especially if you're using a schema migration tool. How many people here use, use Django? <laughs> this is a first. Um, data migration tools frequently have this problem because you, you don't see the SQL that's being generated. It'll just generate this file and say, here, run this, it'll help. And you apply it, and then suddenly the whole database stops. And you think, ah, what is going on? What's going on is it's rewriting the table to add that column. And that can take a long time. Postgres' on this format is extremely efficient. It's about as efficient as a C structure. The downside of that is it's not very, it's not virtual. Every, the whole table has to have pretty much the same structure at the same time. So if you add a non-null column, it'll have to rewrite the table to add that column into every page, every tuple on everything. That's, and, and it will hold the exclusive block while it does so. The first time you do this, it can be extremely surprising. So some variation of you add the column as null. The solution is you add the column as null because that doesn't require rewriting the table. And then set it to non-null later. You're still having to rewrite the whole table to do, to do that set, but it does not require an exclusive block. Lots of I.O. traffic, but not an exclusive block. Two questions about that. Um, I will just state, if you have to take an explicit block on a table, there's 
most useful apps, there's a bug in your application, or at least a misdesign. I will state that categorically because I have never found this out. Not that I haven't done this, but every time I've done it, I realize I'm being, I'm being lazy. Sometimes I'm being acceptably lazy, but I am being lazy. If you think this is the only way you can solve it, see number one. If you're sure this is the only way you can solve it, see number two. Don't do explicit blocking. It, um, it is a huge performance killer, and there's always a better way around it. The, the better way may have implementation complexity associated with it. I will never claim that it's easy, but it is always easy. But, you, but generally, just don't do explicit blocking. That being said, Postgres has a very wide range of explicit blocking programs you can use if that's what you want to do. But, but you mean this just on tables? Um, well, just on tables. Um, <coughs> That's almost always a better way of doing it. I mean, don't do it. Don't do it excessively. You know, don't don't take what I just said and then say, okay, I'll just do a select star from the entire table for share. Huh. <laughs> you know, it's like that's, that's the same thing. But if you just lock the table rows you need, that's the right way of doing it. Okay. So now we're going to talk about something I, that is will require some thought, which is transaction isolation modes. <coughs> Um, you, you will recall I said that Postgres, to the extent possible, tries to create the illusion <coughs> that everybody has their own private copy of the database. The transactional isolation modes are the thing that control what, it, what we mean by to the extent possible. So if there's a conflict between two transactions, what does Postgres consider a conflict and how does it resolve it? The, the transaction isolation modes control that. There are three. That, that actually means something in Postgres. There are, um, there's also read dirty, um, or, or um, what's it called? read uncommitted, I'm sorry. In, um, but that gets you read committed, so it's the same thing. So there are three, there are three. By the, the default is read committed, so we'll talk about it. Um, so just a reminder of how transactions work is all transactions see a snapshot of the database at the start of the transaction. So from its point of view, at the point commit, the begin happens, everybody else just vanishes. There are no other sessions anywhere in the database unless it hits a lot. Which is neat. It's a very conceptually, it's a very easy to understand model. Only writes to the same two. <laughs> so, um, or if someone has done a select, select or update, which, uh, which takes the same kind of model. So, how perfect this isolation is is controlled by it. Um, and what happens if Postgres has to throw up his hands and says, I can't maintain the solution anymore? You must know the truth. That's, that, that's what transaction isolation modes control. So let's talk about the basic one we committed. You see the snapshot of the database. If, you, if all your transaction ever does is read only, it's perfectly consistent. Transactions can lock, but they never fail. And the flicking writes the same row can cause an inconsistent action. So, let's take this, this for an example. So, the transaction um, issues a begin, and it selects I. And then another, select, uh, then another tr transaction sets I to 7. In that same row, or eight three, and commits. This update here will see the will see the old the new value of i, not the old one. So this what will happen is you, even if you're in a transaction, every time you'll see the results of other people's transactions if they commit. So your snapshot can change out from under. It's not absolutely perfect in the case of your computer. The good news is, you'll never fail. You'll just always get new, you'll get new stuff. This is the default behavior. Most of the time, this is correct. But you do have to be aware of this, these inconsistencies. Um, and this is a bad one, because suppose you return to I back to an application. And the application did the same, calculated something, did the increment. But it would have done something different if I had been set to seven. So that's not good. So how do we correct this? 
If we do the select for update, it will take a read block on that tuple. And that other transaction we talked about will block. And we'll um, and, we'll, and, we'll, and um, we'll wait for this we'll wait for this commit to happen. So generally, if you're doing a recommit and you're going to do, um, you need to retrieve data that, is, that, the, that the rest of the transaction depends on, you want to do um, you want to make sure you select it for update. Okay, well, let's say you don't want to do that. You want something a little bit you you want a real honest to goodness consistent snapshot. You get a perfectly consistent snapshot. It will never change based on what other, other transactions do. Um, the problem is, what happens if you do all these writes to the same tuple? Suppose two, um, that the two, two different transactions try to write to the same tuple. One runs and commits. The second one writes the same tuple. And then commits. Which remember, Postgres will not split time. You know, there, there will not be parallel reality. It has to pick one. And the answer is, it will pick one. It will the second one that tries to write the transaction will abort. You'll get an error back when you try and commit. So that's the price of, of getting this perfectly consistent snapshot. You will try to commit, and they'll say, "Sorry, I can't do that because you did something that violated that would require me that violated the consistency of the database." And so you have to rerun the transaction. That's generally what you do in this case is you get this message back and you say, okay, fine, I'll just try again and keep doing it until this uh, until I get it so that each one is consistent. These aren't truly serializable in the mathematical sense. It's very it's relatively straightforward to come up with a situation where the serializability means that the um, that if you have two transactions, it doesn't matter which order they run in, the results will be the same. Um, to successful transactions. This isn't true serializability. It's easy to come up with scenarios where that would be violated, but it's pretty close. So the way to think about it is, this way you are guaranteed a completely consistent snapshot for your whole transaction, but at the cost that when you do a commit, it may say, sorry, I can't commit this transaction, because you did things that would violate, um, that, that would uh, violate serializability. So here's an example. Here's an example of something that won't be caught. You do begin. You select the, the, the um, you select the max of some um, of some counter that's like how what's the last thing I inserted? Insert any new records and commit. This will work, but a parallel transaction doing the same thing will will pick up the same um, will will pick up the same map will uh, the um, will pick up the same max and probably have conflicting keys or something. Because the selects don't, um, the selects can happen in parallel and get the same value. But there's nothing that causes it to think, oh, you've, you've, because you, two rows have things haven't updated the same tuple. And there's no traditional solution to this in any database except taking a whole, whole table log or something like that or something more sophisticated. So this is an example of repeatable read that doesn't quite do what you want for true serializability. As of um, 91, we have actual serializable. Uh, repeatable read used to be called serializable in Postgres. Now it's called repeatable read, and now we have real serializable. It's true mathematical serializability. It's interesting because before 91, if you read the Postgres documentation, there was a note that says, well, well, serializable, which is now called repeatable read, is not true serializability because true serializability is just you know, way too hard to do. No one can really do that. And now we do it. So never say never. It does have overhead associated with it, because it has um, this predicate locking mechanism that has to be maintained. It's not bad, but it does have And as with repeatable read, if you do something that causes that will cause it to violate serializability, you'll get an error.
I'd actually now recommend if you're developing a new sort of a web application kind of thing, try the application with, sort of with the default transaction isolation mode set to serializable. Because from most application developers' point of view, it's kind of what they expect the database, the way they expect the database to work. Um, and especially if you start getting transaction works because of serializable, because of these errors, you've almost certainly discovered a logic error in your, in your application. So it's very nice. There's some overhead in the overhead a little more in most applications. So, okay. A little bit of philosophy about transaction management in Postgres. Um, keep transactions short. Um, there is this unfortunate tendency, especially applications that were ported from old style, like t ish kind of things, to use transactions to implement the cancel button on the user interface. Don't do that. Do not um, do not leave any do not leave a transaction open during an asynchronous event, like user input, like a web request, anything that can take a theoretically undoubted amount of time. Don't do use transaction. Don't have it keep the transaction open during that time. Long running transactions can create all sorts of problems. It can block vacuum and auto vacuum. Um, it can create blocking issues because it's holding blocks that other um, that um, that other things need to create lots of dead tuples in the database. Very bad. Okay. Um, we're actually time for another break. Because otherwise we'll, we'll all die. Um, so, question before we break. Sir. <coughs> I'm sorry for my phone ringing. Sunday morning we have a uh, read and commit or we got a or, or is a crazy idea. There's, there's, there is, um, the SQL standard defines read and committed. Postgres does that. Um, when you implement. When you issue a read and commit, what you get is read committed. Um, it's, it's legal to say, set transaction isolation mode, read committed, read and read, read and committed. You don't get it though. Um, the, the, the MVCC model of Postgres basically would make it very complicated to actually implement real read and commit. So there is no way right now in Postgres to see the dirty results of another transaction. Did I, was that the question? Did, I'm sorry, did I, did I answer your question? Yeah. Uh, last week, I, I will read some blog of current of current of members and, and say uh, that you need frozen ID to, to mark the old room. Okay. <laughs> Oh, um, a vacuum, a vacuum freeze. Prop. It sounds like so you're getting messages about in the logs or. Uh, I, I, I want, I want, I want to, know, want to know. Um, the the frozen ID is use unit or. or well, the pro, um, are you are you you look like you may be linear. You very after the break. Okay, L I'll explain about frozen ID. It's actually a fairly complicated topic. And I only figure, finally figured it out. So, uh, but if, I, if you want, I will explain about what that frozen XID thing means. Absolutely. There was somebody else. Yes. Yes. Uh, we used to have in a real application uh, tables that have uh, all modifications of some critical data. Mm -hmm. uh, this have a, a lot of work. And I asked me, I asked you, can uh, uh, use some inside the, the Oracle, uh, the popular machine, that have uh, the old versions, uh, not uh, the latest. Okay. Um, you know, the, 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 the popular do not delete the old version of code. I mean, you could certainly scavenge things off the disk if they haven't been vacuumed up. Um, the, the question is, can you access old versions of a tuple? Yes. Not in normal operation is the easiest way. There's no like primitive that lets you say do it. There are ways you can rewind the data. Well, you can't rewind the database. You can build a new database that that matches a particular old point in time. And we can talk about that later. Um, but there's and obviously you can scavenge things off the disk if necessary. But that's but in normal operation, the tuple a, a dead tuple is dead. Okay, it can't be. So, because uh, we thought that if, if I, I 
things that I am not the, the only man that do this, that have a, a table with all the modifications, yes, history modifications. Yeah, uh, well, it, it, uh, several people do that. <laughs> no, I, I, I understand what you're saying, it, and you do hear about the way MVCC works, and you think, gosh, I don't need all these audit tables. Okay. I can just build them, and that would be great, and it's the really <coughs>
if you allow this number to, the, the, eventually, this 32 bits wraps around. And you would effectively lose transactions. Tuples would vanish out of the database. Because the comparison between them wouldn't work anymore because of this 32 bit wrap around. And that's very bad. So the, their posters will go and stamp tuples that are of sufficient age, and how old they are depends on the various parameter settings, with a magic transaction ID, which is called the frozen X ID. Those tuples are older by definition than any other tuples in the database. So the transaction ID wraparound problem doesn't apply to them. Vacuum normally takes care of this work. So if you're running auto vacuum, it will once in a while go and stamp old tuples with this frozen transaction ID. And it's normally something you don't have to worry about. The problem is, the problem shows up in one of two places. The first is, in normal operations, in order to change this, this transaction ID, Postgres has to rewrite that tuple on disk. And the way this, the, what the symptom is, there'll be some gigantic table, and nine months after Postgres has started, suddenly auto vacuum daemon starts rewriting the whole table. And you think, oh my god, what has happened here? That's what's going on. It's having to freeze these tuples to avoid transaction ID wrapper. The other issue is, sometimes auto vacuum isn't working on a table. Um, this is generally because of long running transactions, auto vacuum has been disabled, or you, um, you're you updating the table really fast and, and auto vacuum is not able to keep up. Then you start getting errors, messages in the log, warning messages saying, um, this table is getting really old and I'm going to need to freeze it at some point. Eventually, they will switch to another warning that says, really, I am going to have to freeze this table. Eventually, if you do nothing and ignore these warnings, Postgres will shut down and require that you start the server in single user mode so it can go and freeze those tables. Because the option is losing data. So, that's an overview of transaction freezing. It's the main way that it, it hurts you is this freezing process. Um, I don't have slides prepared. There are ways of tuning it to, um, to do this. The other thing to do is what is, is Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve is the secret to fixing all the vacuum, which is just on almost all servers worldwide, the lowest traffic period is 5 p.m. on Christmas Eve. <laughs> Unless you're doing a, uh, because, uh, uh, so one thing you can do is manually do a vacuum freeze at that point. And just let it do its thing and rewrite the whole table in the database. Is this, um, if this sounds slightly hokey, <laughs> if, if this sounds slightly eh, you're right, it is. But um, the, the, the basic idea is, if this vacuum freeze I.O. problem is a bad one, to pick extremely low traffic periods and manually do the vacuum freeze and let it do its thing. And you can just do the, the command is actually just vacuum freeze to do this. So that's a quick overview of vacuum freeze. I'm sure there are lots of questions about it. Just hit me up later. I wanted to get through the rest of this on, the, on, on, on it. I also have specific parameter settings I can recommend for vacuum freeze. So I'm going to, I'm going to accelerate my talk a bit because we're short on time. But schema design is a very big topic. Um, only scratch the surface. Generally, keep your data in normal form. It's there for a reason. Don't be afraid to do joins. Coming from other databases, especially less performant databases, especially MySQL, people are afraid of doing joins. Postgres joins extremely well. Don't denormalize except in response to a real problem. If you run into a real issue, sometimes denormalization can be like all of, you know, like the, the aspirin, and suddenly your headache goes away, and it's great. But pick, make sure there's a real problem, not not just, oh, I think this will be better than you um, I alluded to this thing called the batch slow rule, which is put batch changing data in the same table as slow changing data. For example, um, e-commerce applications are a very a constant example of this. You'll have a user record. One half of it is their email address, 
and the date they signed up, which almost never change. The other one is the last click time, which changes a lot. Separate those into different records. The, the fast changing stuff in, in a user activity table, the slow changing stuff in a base user record. A lot of locking problems vanish when you do this. Because user tends to be the parent of a zillion foreign keys. <laughs> so you, you will be amazed how many problems just uh, evaporate when you do this. Indexes. Um, I would say I've received a lot of consult uh, let's say nine or ten consulting things that said, we want you to come in and add some indexes. Which is a little bit, you know, like say, you know, my car isn't running, we want you to come in and replace the battery cable. How do you know that's the problem? It probably isn't. A good so let's talk about good indexes. Good index is highly selective. So, for example, if you have a database of the entire population of Argentina, gender is probably not a good thing to index on because half the, you know you know half or one half the other, or however you find it. In San Francisco, you know half or one half the other, and then there's about eight other cases. Um, it's frequently used. So you query on that index, you query the, 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 that index condition a lot. Or it's required to enforce a constraint, in which case you have to have an index. A bad index is every other index. If it does not meet these criteria, it is not a good index, and you should throw it out of your database immediately. Leave here, issue the drop index. Um, create indexes on the basis of real life queries. It is completely reasonable to start a database with no indexes and then optimize for it. Look for sequential scans that can be sped up. Indexes aren't cheap. They take up a lot of space. They take up time to maintain. It is not unusual for the indexes to take up more space than the table itself. That's actually quite common. Look at the, these two um, milking tables inside the Postgres. They're used. Have, um, this will tell you how many times a table has been sequentially scanned, which is a hint that maybe there's an index that needs happening. This will tell you how many, um, of how often an index has been used. If this index isn't being used very often, get rid of it. Look for lots of sequential scans or not many index scans. <coughs> I see many people writing, so I'll pause. Okay, that's schema design. The important thing to remember on index, you know, that's like, please my schema design. But the important thing about indexes is selectivity. Generally, if you're doing queries that return less than 10, 10 to 20 percent of the table, a good index is good. If it returns more than 10, if a single query returns more than 10 to 20 percent, an index is less efficient than sequentially scanning the table. So, you really, the perfect index is one where you get exactly one record. A terrible index is where you get you get half the table. So um, there, there is this idea that you just should always create an index on anything you query on. Resist that temptation. Only on things that were really is where selectivity is really good. So some common Postgres pitfalls. This happens all the time on Postgres. The Postgres general maintenance. list. Somebody builds this giant database. They log in. They say select count star from a huge table, and it takes forever. And they ask, why does Postgres suck so bad? They issue that. And they ask that. The problem is it's implemented as a whole table scale. Because it needs to check if that, because that count star is going to be exactly right. It's going to be 100% accurate, and it needs to scan the whole table. So don't do that. If your entire application is built around doing count stars on giant tables, Maybe you should rethink your application. <laughs> Real life applications don't do that. Um, so you need to, interestingly enough, there are optimizations coming in Postgres that will, that will accelerate that. But you know, if, the, if you're constantly doing slot count stars on one, tables with one billion rows, yes, that's not going to be a super fast operation. In place operating. OK, this is nobody's favorite feature of Postgres, or lack thereof. Upgrading a major version using just the core product requires a dump and a restore. And if, uh, if all you're using is the base, is what comes in the box with the Postgres. That can be, you know, if you have a 12 terabyte database, that can be slightly impractical. Like, it's never going to happen. 
There's no in-place upgrading for you. you have, there is a tool in Contrib, PG Upgrade. Um, it does have bugs sometimes, and you need to be aware of that. You know, um, I really like the author a lot. He's a great guy. That's the thing. If you, if, you, if you read between the lines, you might think this is not a ringing endorsement of it. Um, the other option is trigger-based replication, the products like Sloney or Ricardo. So those are beyond the scope of this talk, but you can use that. You can do it with that. You can, you can upgrade using those. And that's the typical way for upgrading very large databases. Auto vacuum. It's background process that does vacuuming. You can probably guess that. It handles most workloads very well. Um, unfortunately, it can sort of turn on exactly the wrong time. Um, you do these massive changes to a table, you're doing this giant update, and then you hit the limit, and auto vacuum wakes up, it just makes your life more miserable on this database. Or it can run wild for mysterious reasons. One thing you can do is turn off and do manual vacuuming. Um, this is, I don't recommend this except for very specific workloads. Ones that have a very heavy sinusoidal pattern, like this, those can be good ones for manual vacuum. Do the manual vacuum at the, at the low point, and, not, and so auto vacuum doesn't hurt you at the high point. But overall, it will work harder. The system will work harder doing this. You must run vacuum. So you must promise me that if you do turn on auto vacuum, you do do regular vacuums at least daily. And be sure to do the analyze at the same time. Um, if you're doing bulk loads in an application, please use copy, not insert. It is so much faster. Um, copy does all the right things. It does container protection, fire triggers, and does all that. Make sure to do a vacuum after to do the analyze. Okay, so a little bit about the button. What happens when the, the first one is this query is slow? What you're going to do is run it using the standard explain analyze. Um, <coughs> Explain, prints out the query plan that it's going to run at that moment. Explain, analyze actually runs it and shows you the result. That shows you, it won't show you the results of the query, it'll show you the results that um, the, it'll, it'll annotate the query plan with how long each portion of the query took. The output is somewhat cryptic. Um, it is a true, um, it's a tree structure you read from the bottom up is the trick. Um, if you don't know about this website, before, this, is, this, this website will help you a great deal by cutting and pasting the query plan into it and parsing it. Parse it. It's also great for gathering, um, for gathering interesting things to look at because, you can, because people can make their queries public on it. Um, the database is small. So, the, so what you need to look at is, okay, what's going on? Um, PG stat activity is a view that shows you every, everything that's running in the system and what query they're doing at that moment. Do a tail out of the logs to see, or, you know, or whatever, to see what's going on. Look at IOSAT to see if the ISO system is being swamped. And then there's the horrible, oh my god, database is responding. Well, make sure the database is up. Um, if it's not, there's your problem right there. Um, can you connect locally with PSQL? Very frequently it's that something intermediate went down instead. Again, PG stat activity. Look at PG locks. Um, one nice thing you can do is PG stat activity and PG locks both take process IDs. Um, PG stat activity <coughs> sets what um, gives the current process. PG lock gives uh, the process ID of uh, um, who holds the lock. So you can bounce back and forth between these to say what each one's waiting on. And that's very nice. Doing backups. Well, there's the cheat your hole comes comes does exactly what it says on the tin. PG dump. Built-in dumper storage tool. Takes a logical snapshot of the database. It actually uses MPCC to get the logical snapshot. Um, it doesn't lock the database or prevent writes to disk. It does prevent schema modifications while it's going on. But the database is up and running just fine with PG dump. And it is being sold to disk and all that stuff is working. So um, it has a relatively low load on the database. It's not zero, but it is <coughs> For small databases, it's the way to go. PG Restore does the opposite. It's not fast. Rebuilding the indexes can take a while. Um, 
it's great for simple backups, but if you need to move your site back up right away from a major failure, PG Restore is not going to be is not going to be super fast. You know, it's it's hours. You know, it can be lots of minutes to hours, not a second, not a couple, a handful of minutes. For that, you want wait time recovery. Um, you can do file system level snapshots of the database with archives and log. Um, one of the nice things is if you're doing this, the file system snapshot doesn't need to be a comment or consistent. It could just be a, a it could just be a copy minus R. Because the wall files will heal the inconsistency when they're replaying. So that's very nice. You know, for example, if you're running off sand, it does snapshotting, or you're running on EBS, which does snapshotting, you can use that to take your snap your file system snapshot, which is really fast. The good part about this is Backups, you know, a backup defends you against the disk dying and things like that. But what happens if you push out a new version of your application and it runs wild and destroys a bunch of data? That happens. You log in, do a drop table, and then realize you're connected to the production system, not the development system. That happens. This lets you mix those. Because you can replay to a point in time, not just the most current. Just an overview is you start setting up wall segment archive. Which, and wall segment archive means you're making copies of the wall segments as they're being finished to a different place. You make a base backup, and the base backup really is just um, copy, just making a file system copy. Keep archiving wall segments, and just let them just repeat. Each time you make a base backup, you only need the, the wall segments that were generated from that point onward, so you can throw away everything else. And the wall segments that you generated after, plus the base backup, those are your backup. Taken together with that set of files that you have. So, to archive wall segments, the archive mode you pull the um, on, you set an archive command, which is the thing that will copy the wall segments off. Um, make sure that these are going on to a different machine than your primary machine. And um, on the cloud host, Make sure that if you're fired up two virtual machines, they're really on the same different underlying hosts. Then you do a base backup. Issue this command and start backup. Do a file system local copy. It will be inconsistent. We don't care. That's okay. Postgres continues operating, and then you do a stop backup. And then you just keep archiving the wall segments. And then you can you can take the take the base. Replay the wall segments at any particular point in time or all the way to the most current. And when it's been too long to recover quickly because you know you hit the base backup was, was 18 months ago and you now have 10 million wall segments, take another back base backup and you're ready to go. So downsides. You have to remember each bank of each wall segment 16 megabytes. They do zip down very nicely. They do compress. It takes a while to replay them. And doing a base backup via a copy operation may take prohibitively long if it's a huge, you know, get 16 terabyte database. So the next step is warm standby. Um, you can have a secondary server which continually integrates these wall segments. Every time you get, every time the wall segment is generated, it picks it up and storms it into the database. And now it's as consistent as that wall segment. And that means when, when the, if there's a failure, bang, you come back up instantly. Very nice. You still need to do the base backup on the wall segments, and you need to keep those someplace else to do point in time recovery. Because the form standby will go up to the minute, and if you want to replay, and you can't rewind the Postgres server. So you have to generate a new Postgres server to do the post point in time recovery. So the bad news is um, a secondary in this mode can't be used for queries. All it can do is recover. So you don't get any load balancing. It can be a kind of pain to manage all these wall segments flying all over the place. And the, the, there is going to be this lag for when the, the primary closes all the wall segment as we picked up, moved over to the other machine, and the other and, and integrates it. And that could be, there's probably in the order of seconds, but it depends on how, what the network connection is like. So, what we can do even better than this replication. So, Postgres has built in stream replication as a version. It's very nice and it's very easy to set up. Don't pay me to set it up. I'll, I'll take it. But, you know, it's, it's really easy to set up. Trigger based replication, or there are also trigger based replication. Sloney, Ricardo, all of these. Do pay me to set these up. They are complicated to do. Um, built 
in replication. It's in the core. Um, the master in a read write error, uh, in, a, in a stream replication error, is read write. The secondaries you can query against. You can only do read only queries, but you can query. And this was true at, um, as of as of nine two. You can actually have tree structures. Um, nine um, as of the slide. You could, but it's really fast. Um, you, it picks up um, secondaries pick up changes very quickly. Um, secondaries can be great, which makes a great flow down. One of the great things about this is if you make a TDL change and create a table or a database or whatever, it's pushed immediately to the secondary. There's no fancy synchronization process. It's pushed as part of the stream, which is great. So there's the bad news. This is the big bad news. The entire database cluster is replicated or nothing else. It is an exact image of every database, every table, everything. There's no partial. Any change is propagated, including your mistakes. <laughs> so if you drop a table, well, it's going to bang, pick up that table drop right there. So it does not protect you against that kind of data. And it can require some tuning for cancellation issues. To a quick overview of that is, when you're running a query on the secondary, it's potentially true a change could come in from the master that invalidates that query. Postgres could do one of two things. It can just immediately throw up its hands and say, sorry, your query's now invalid, you have to rerun it. Or it can hold off the change. Or um, for, um, it can hold off that change and apply it when the query is done. The tuning parameters control at what point in time, how long it will wait to apply the change, including infinity. Of course, then once the query finishes, it has to work on catch up. But, so you need to tune those. Uh, but that's okay. The setup is do a base backup. There's a file called recovery.com on the secondary that points to the master that tells it how to connect to the master. Bring up the secondary, pop it. I mean, it really is virtually that easy. It's like 10 minutes to get it set up. Um, there's a built in tool called PG Base Backup. Uh, it's a built in tool. Base back up to the secondary makes it even easier. Um, there's repmanager.org. Check that out for prepackaged tools for setting up a modern application. <coughs> Simon, can I ask you a question? Oh, when, in a query cancellation situation where it's holding off applying changes, where are, are those? Is the mat, um, are they being sent to the master and then held at the secondary, or are they being um, held at the master? <coughs> Sorry, could you? Um, so you're in a query cancellation situation. Um, you know, you're in a query conflict on the standby. On the standby. And it's, and it's not, a, so, it, so it's holding apply changes to the secondary. Yeah. Where are those changes queuing up? Uh, on the secondary or on the master? Is it just holding? You no, know, the, the actual physical replication continues to work. It's just that they need to apply. Okay, so, so, so they're, they're, they're still the streaming. The streaming is still going on. Is just on Thank you. That question came up. Simon was the principal author of this, so the good replication, so ask him. <laughs> um, so, generally, you can't accept these limitations, like, for example, the all or nothing part isn't good for you. You need something more sophisticated. Um, or you need to be able to write to the secondary as well as the primary. We have trigger based replication. <clears throat> um, generally, these, these all work the same way, pretty much. They install triggers on the master. Um, and every time this trigger fires, it records the changes. And then a daemon picks it up and applies it to the secondaries. Um, they're all third party add ons, most of are not part of the core. Um, the good parts, they tend to be really configurable. Any, any imagined topology or settings or anything like that, you'll find it. Um, you can push all or part of the tables, you can push subsets of the table itself. Um, Lucardo has multi master setups. So, um, I use Ricardo a lot. It's, it's a new product. The bad side. They do tend to be fiddly and complex to set up. This is where it can pay to have a consultant come. Um, right now, there's no way to make automatically distributed schema changes. You have to make sure that the schema changes get distributed manually. That's, it can be pretty bad because if you forget, usually that silently breaks replication. And it, imposes, it can impose a significant amount of overhead on the 
master these trigger firings are free. Okay, cooling. So why would you want to do cooling? Cooling is where there's a piece of software that sits between the client and Postgres and manages the connections. Opening connection to Postgres is pretty expensive. It's a fairly heavy operation because it has to fire off, it has to fork off the new backing process. Um, for small queries, you can take longer to connect than it does to actually run the query. Um, so if you, you have more than 200, 300 connections active at the same time in Postgres, you probably want to use There are two that are worth talking about that I know of. There's PG Bouncer, it's developed by Skype, who knows a thing or two about big Postgres installs. Um, it's really easy to install. Um, it's very fast, it's just a little bit and it's thousands of connections with no problem. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't do failover, load balancing, all those kinds of extra stuff. It's just a front end viewer. Cheap and cheerful. Um, if you want load balancing, you can use things like HA proxy. Um, if you want something a little more sophisticated, there's PG Pool 2. Um, it does query analysis. It actually looks at the queries as they go by. So it can route selects to a, the master and in, um, or inserts the master and selects to the secondary in a replication there. That's pretty neat. You can do load balancing, failover, secondary promotion, and, you know, does your laundry, and there's like features on those features there. Um, it is higher overhead and it is more complex to set up. Because it has to like take apart queries and stuff. Um, just a quick note about the hardware and the system. Um, cloud hosting. Um, cloud hosting has terrible IO. <laughs> there are individual cases where it does, but this is this is your first assumption, especially if you're not paying very much for cloud hosting. Probably where this where, where the economy is being made is in the IO. Above a certain size, your database is going to be IO bound, so you can kind of see what the problem is here. Um, so you make this a bad situation. Um, generally, you want to get as much RAM as you can afford up to twice the database size. Um, CPU capacity is not as important as RAM. Generally, Postgres is not CPU bound. It is almost always IO bound. Um, if you're running PostGIS, it's an exception to that because PostGIS tends to be very computation intensive. Um, make sure that whatever you're running on is reliable. That's not true of all cloud hosts. And um, I would say always use replication. Make sure your replica on different physical machines um, is, um, is uh, the primary. This is a particular problem on Amazon because although Amazon doesn't say so, in my experience, Amazon has, has host affinity for servers. So if you create two, in, two smaller instances in a row, they'll probably be on the same box. And um, make sure that your settings and everything like that are stored somewhere because machines can't just die and expect or you can just like say, forget all this and run on Heroku and they'll solve, they'll have a little problem for you. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. There, you can get a performance benefit on EBS if you're running on Amazon. Um, at the expense, but the problem is you lose EBS's snapshotting capability, which is one of the nicest parts about EBS. Um, Ubuntu 11.04 seems the most stable um, operating system on EC2, which is kind of a shame because it's approaching end of life. Um, and just a reminder, EBS can fail. It, you have to be prepared for that. But you know, hard disks fail too, so you, know, you just have the same flaw. Okay. Um, check if you're running on Amazon, check out Wally from Heroku because it will um, for doing snapshot backups. It's very nice. If you're running on your own hardware or your own niche hardware, like a, a, a hosting provider is giving it to you. If you afford SSDs, get SSDs. They're very nice. Um, RAID 10. Uh, remember, SSDs fail the same way hard drives fail, so don't rely on them always working. Uh, put the transaction logs in their own volume. Move PG stat temp, which is a little directory that holds the statistics to a RAM disk. They're thrown away on a system restart anyway, so that's fine. Um, and use either XFS or EXT or don't use AXT as the classes. A little bit about tools. Always monitor Postgres. Monitor, monitor, monitor. You know, I also do video production, and the way you can tell that a, 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 somebody's a professional video person is they're monitoring their sound. You know, because it's that little, that little sign they really know what they're doing. 
Monitoring your database server is how we know you really know what you're doing. Use Dogios or Ganglia to monitor, at least monitor this space. Because running your primary database server out of this space is really embarrassing. Um, CPU usage, because spikes there are almost always a sign of some problem or other. Um, memory usage, generally, if you configure it right, most of us will go to this little strip of used memory and this big honking bit of file system cache. You want to make sure that's what you see. And replication lag, because replication can fail and generally it will fail silently. And the, your sign will be suddenly the, the primary, the secondary is not keeping up with the primary. Um, if you're using Nagios, there's a plugin called check underscore postgres.pl at bucardo.org. Same place you get the Bucardo replication. It's very it's handy. It, it monitors like 20,000 things, 90% 90, 90 of which you never want to monitor. Um, if you don't like the, uh, PSQL, you should though. PSQL is wrong. Um, there's PGMN2. It's comprehensive, it's open source, it crashes a little bit, but you know, that doesn't matter. Um, there's Navicat. And so especially for Windows and Apple, that's nice. It's a commercial product, it's not Postgres real specific. For analyzing your log files, um, PG Queen um, is traditional, it's not maintained much anymore, but you'll see lots of references to it. Uh, a Queen is a, um, it's a stoat, or a, a, a reason. Um, you have for 9.1 and 9.2 log files, you need to patch it. There's a newer one, PG Badger, from Lebo in France. This is kind of the new hotness. This is what I, I would recommend using now. But this is why Badger, you know, they, they root around in logs is the reason. I, the small mammal thing. Um, it's brand new, it's actively maintained. This one's written in PHP. Uh, this one's written in Perl. Much nicer. And that's my presentation. Um, Even on a session basis, even, even per transaction, 
it, um, the, it into synchronous mode, where it will wait until the secondary has acknowledged it's received and committed the transaction. So one way of building this architecture is, desi is have a designated a master in waiting, effectively, that's synchronous. And you know because it's synchronous, it will always be for, at the farthest ahead of any secondary. So if the master fails, the master in waiting takes over, and all the secondary can reconnect to him. So that's probably the right architecture. Long answer to a short question. Yeah. Can you delay the, the replication to about 10 minutes uh, of, of uh, the no, of, no, of no, no, of time? There's no set. Um, the answer really is no. There's no there's no real facility for doing that. You can kind of sort of fake it using the, the query delay mechanism, but that's like that's totally a hack. I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> um, so the answer is no. There's no there is no backup. You know there's no way of saying always stay ten minutes behind the master or something like that. It's you know an imaginable feature, but that's not there is a way. Yes, yeah, you can do that with log shift. Generally, you know, sort of like our base configuration, you know, when we're setting something up um, and the database is valuable and it's worth spending some money keeping it good, is to set up a primary and a secondary, and then a tertiary server that's a log shipping server that's actually a cold standby, it's not running, um, but it receives all the logs, it receives the place backup, someplace geographically remote. You know, we're based in California, 365 main is a big data center there. Bad things happen in California occasionally in the form of you know big earthquakes. So you know then we, uh, you don't want to put everything right there. Another recent example is you know Amazon US East. You know storms happen. <laughs> and, you know the generators don't last forever. So it's a good idea to have a secondary someplace you know in a different data center uh, in case you know or in case you know meteorite destroys the, destroys the East Coast. You know you still want to make sure your gambling sites up. You know, so people need something to do. So civilization falls apart. So, um, so that kind of three server configuration is kind of like our standard, you know, here's what you should do, now tell us what you're going to afford kind of situation. And that's that's how we would handle the, you know, because the nice part about that is also you don't have to like make sure that somebody wakes up, answers the pager within 10 minutes. <laughs> you know, it's like you have a little more control over the time frame. Pueden ir a comer, ahora les van a decir dónde hay lugares cerca y arrancamos a las dos después.